What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And as always, I like to say that the Dr. Vibe show is the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. Also know that I am a certified empowerment coach, and I'm president and CEO of Expression Vibe Coaching and Communications. And we have another well, new friend because he's solo, but he's already been on some other epic conversations on Sunday nights on my Do You Know What Time It Is regular conversation piece. But today we've got him by himself, new friend for the Dr. Vibe show, leadership guru Jim Kennedy he has over 28 years of leadership experience and has served in management positions at various levels with the federal government and in private industry. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in business. Man, we educated, as well as graduate <laughs> certificate in project management. You don't joke, Jim. You don't joke. He, spends, no. he now spends his time writing and speaking on the topic of leadership development as and as a licensed realtor recruiter at Keller Williams Realty. You can find him on his website, Twitter, Facebook, and on LinkedIn when he's not working, which with all that stuff going on, I don't know when he isn't. He's active in his community. He is committed, a committed husband and the father of three children, supports the death and special needs communities, and is involved with his local church. He resides with his family in Austin, Texas, home of South by Southwest. And Absolutely. He, and he is also the author of a book, Discerning God's Purpose, A Father's Journey from Tragedy to Truth, Welcome to the Dr. Vibe Show on his own for the first time, Jim Kennedy. How are you, Jim? I'm doing great, Dr. Vibe. How are you? I am blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles and a solution for someone's problem. I'm also just giving a shout out to Tish Rosales. Thank you so much for stopping by. And yes, last night was an epic conversation and another one's com coming up right now. So, Jim, uh, also, you know what? We all got to say another thing. Congratulations on something. Let's see if What's, you know what. Let me see if you know what I'm congratulating you about. <laughs> yes, I think I do. I just became a contributing writer to the Good Men Project. Yes, congratulations on that, sir. Great, great, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also a contributing writer to the Huffington Post. Uh, so life is uh, life is fun right now. That is excellent. Now. Let's find out about life before you became this wonderful writer that's on all these platforms. Where did you grow up? What was life like growing up at a, as a young Jim? Uh, I was born in uh, Washington, D.C., obviously the capital of the United States. Um, and my dad was uh, in the military. He was in the Air Force. So I am a military brat. Uh, my mom worked in private industry. And so we actually moved around a little bit. I've lived in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, growing up, I also lived in Honolulu, Hawaii, which was wonderful, nice and warm. Uh, after uh, essentially coming back to the D.C. area and uh, uh, graduating from uh, high school, I went to Howard University, a historically black college uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, and I joined the military myself. So I was uh, uh, in the uh, United States Army. I was commissioned officer in the Army. And uh, after I got out of the Army, I uh, did my tour in the Army. I uh, went to work and started the uh, 28 years of leadership and management experience that uh, you referenced in the beginning. So it's, uh, it's been quite a journey. Excellent. And I, before we go further, I want to shout out uh, two more outstanding people, Tachi, who was on our conversation last night talking about the state of live streaming and her producer, Curtis Brooks, a man who's doing some outstanding things when it comes to production of live stream. And oh, Tati saying, hey, Bison, H-U. <laughs> Tachi, H-U. Yeah, Tachi is a graduate of, uh, of uh, Howard University. And actually, my father is a graduate of Howard University. Oh, really? Yeah, I and I think I may have shared this last night or shared in a previous conversation with somebody else. When he went to Howard University, one of his teachers was the great Tony Morrison. Oh, yes. 
So there the one you thing go. about Howard University, you never know who's going to who's going to drop by to teach. Absolutely. Now you just dropped so much knowledge early. I'm going to see if I can recall some of it because I was looking at the screen and all this stuff. Honolulu, Hawaii. Yes. Army brat. What was like? Well, I, was an, what, what, I was an Air Force brat, and and okay. then uh, later on, I was actually in the Army. Yes. Excellent. Family life growing up, brothers, sisters. I'm actually, uh, believe it or not, I'm an only child. Okay. And uh, it's really funny because then uh, when I grew up, I actually married a woman who was also an only child. No, but, uh, no you're, you're joking. I, I'm not. I, I'm dead serious. And so uh, I actually, uh, uh, I grew up as an only child, but uh, uh, especially in the D.C. area, uh, my parents both came from a uh, big family. So there were a lot of cousins, uncles and aunts. Uh, around so uh, even though I was an only child it didn't really feel like one what do you remember about your days growing up as a military brat because it's interesting the more and more people or more and more friends I have coming on this conversation a lot of people were military brats <laughs> well my dad was born in uh, my dad comes from North Carolina and a very small town in north, uh, western North Carolina called Newton. Uh, and uh, he actually, once he graduated from high school, he went into the Air Force. Uh, not a lot of opportunities, especially at that time in, in that town. And so he kind of grew up. And for me, growing up as a military child, uh, it was great to be able to see different parts of the country and the world. Uh, it was also it provided me with a sense of discipline, a sense of uh, values, and there were certain things that uh, were expected of me uh, because not just necessarily I was a military child, which uh, we, we had certain uh, standards, if you will, but uh, also being uh, my father's child, uh, he was, uh, as a military uh, man, he, was, uh, he, he had a sense of humor, but when it came to uh, doing what you were supposed to do and uh, and also doing your best, he was fairly no nonsense. So uh, there are certain times when uh, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Uh, sometimes I kind of thought I was a recruit in the uh, military versus a son. <laughs> you know, and that's and you you're reading my mind because when I was growing up, I'm still growing up, but when I was younger, let me put it that way. When I was younger, <laughs> I'm still growing up. I don't know if yeah. I'm ever going to, I don't know if I'm ever going to really grow up, but I'm growing continuously in different ways, different days, but we'll leave that to another conversation <laughs> that uh, sometimes I felt that I was a student of my dad's instead of his son. Right. So I can relate to what you're saying there about the discipline and all that. What did your mother bring to the table? My mom, uh, my dad was uh, very much a disciplinarian. My mom was as well, but um, they really kind of came at it from two different angles. My mom really taught me a lot about, my dad had uh, compassion as well, but I, I learned a lot of compassion from my mom. I also learned really from both of them that no matter what it, you want to accomplish, if you work hard enough and if you focus, uh, you can achieve it. But uh, when we were in Hawaii, for example, my mom didn't work, uh, so she was with me a lot. And I, I really learned uh, a softer side with her. I, I really learned uh, a lot about communication with her. But also, I learned uh, there is no excuse for uh, what we call, I won't say failure, but there's no excuse for not trying. You can, uh, you can, it's okay to fail, but as long as you try, because if you, if you fail, you will learn something and you will actually be able to go forward and do better next time. But if you try, you just, if you don't try, you don't just give up. Uh, that's not acceptable. So I learned compassion, but I also learned from her, uh, you better get up and do what you need to do, uh, because there's no laziness in this house. Understood. And I just want to encourage again, shout out to everyone that's uh, watching this live right now. If you have any questions and or comments, please uh, type them in. I'm sure that Jim will be able to answer them. And if not, he'll parking lot them like a good leader and come back to you on them. So it's all good. 
I want to ask then after finishing school, what was your first step? Where did, where did you go after you finished education? Uh, when I finished my undergraduate, I actually, I, I attended Howard University on a, uh, an ROTC scholarship, the Reserve Officer Training Course uh, scholarship. And after that, as part of the deal, uh, the Army said, okay, we paid for your school, now it's time for you to serve. So I actually, uh, I was commissioned into the Army, and I went to uh, the officer, actually, I have stayed with at uh, Howard as a recruiter for a couple of months before I went to the officer's basic course out in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I was there for about six months and then I went overseas and uh, I, I served in Germany uh, until the end of my tour. And I was originally supposed to do about four years. And uh, after two years, this was in the late eighties when the, uh, the army, uh, actually I should say, uh, uh, the Secretary of Defense told the Army that we had too many uh, uh, too many soldiers, and so you actually had the ch opportunity to leave early. And I really said, okay, this is great, but I don't know if I'm going to make this a career. So I actually went from active duty to the reserves in 1990, and uh, and right after my my claim to fame is. I left Germany on August 1st, 1990, and what happened on August 2nd, 1990, was Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait, and I actually left the army on August 3rd, and a couple of weeks after that, President uh, Her George Herbert Walker Bush actually instituted what's called a stop loss, which means that nobody else can leave the military, and so a lot of my friends who were going to be leaving just after me ended up having to stay, and my unit was actually sent over to uh, Saudi Arabia to participate in the first Gulf War. Wow. So I actually left just before uh, that war kicked off. And, uh, but right after the, uh, the military, I actually went into private industry as a uh, IT and business consultant and really started my career from there. Was there any... How did you feel not having to participate in the war? Um, there was some, I had conflicting emotions, to be honest. Uh, I left and I knew that it was time for me to leave. Uh, obviously, you feel for the friends that you still have that are still there. And you those are your buddies, so you obviously want to serve. But I also chalked it up to, okay, this is God's purpose. Luckily, none of my friends uh, were hurt or in, uh, or killed, so that was good. Um, but my, I, I really thought it was just God's plan, and uh, I, I left. And uh, by this time, I was married, so my wife and I left and, and came back to the states. Uh, but I didn't leave the service completely. I actually went from active duty into the reserves. Okay, good, good. Uh, how did you meet your wonderful wife? It's funny. Uh, a friend of mine from high school actually went to college with my wife. I, I went to Howard University, and she went to Hampton University, another HBCU. So we, we kind of have a running joke of who attended the real HU because at the time she graduated, <laughs> it was called Hampton Institute. Yes. Now it's Hampton University. Okay. And so we, we kind of have those, uh, those, uh, the running joke going on. But uh, I actually met her uh, uh, through that friend and right before, right after I got commissioned. And so I, about a year and a half into my tour was when I came back and we got married in uh, Virginia. And uh, five days later, she was on a, uh, uh, a plane going over to Germany with me. Wow. Wow. You have a long career. I in, do. In, in not only military-wise, but also in the business world. What, did you, what are some of the things that you learned in each one of those areas? From the military, um, and I think Colin Powell really said it best, was uh, everything that he knew uh, about leadership, he learned at the, uh, in infantry school. And my 
foundation for leadership I learned in uh, field artillery school. It's the same thing about uh, leading people, which is the foundation is, is being trust. But I, I learned about the fact that if you're honest with people and you're doing your best and you, you say what you can do and what you cannot do and ask for help when you need it, that people will follow you all day long. And, uh, and so I learned that in the military. After that, I started with, uh, I came back and I, was, I, I worked in private industry as a consultant. Uh, and uh, I was doing that for about 12 years, uh, 12, 13 years. And I learned, uh, and that's where I really kind of started with uh, working with teams, working on projects, uh, becoming a project leader, project manager, program manager. And, and I really learned to lead uh, there, not just with people, but then you're also, I was responsible for resources in, uh, uh, in the military. But I learned when I was working on the civilian side the difference between leadership and management. Leadership dealing with leading people, management managing resources. And so the uh, so during that time, when I was still working in private industry, uh, my wife and I we we moved around a lot. Uh, we came back to D.C. Uh, after a few years, I actually went back and got my master's degree, my wife and I decided to, to really just jump all in and try and finish our master's degrees as quickly as we could. So literally we worked full time and went to school full time for two years. And I thought we were gonna lose our minds. But after we did that, I got another job uh, with a, a Fortune 10 company and we moved from the Washington DC area to Cincinnati, Ohio. and during that time, again, still uh, growing in my career, uh, after being married for almost 10 years is when we had our oldest daughter, our oldest child. And um, after that, when we had our oldest child, I like to say I learned about leadership before then in the military, but I didn't really become a leader until I became a parent. And... Um, and the reason I say that is from a career perspective, yes, I had great positions, but from a personal perspective, I really got an up close and personal experience of what true leadership is. And that was really understanding my purpose. And uh, so that was a very key moment for me. And that's a very, as we say in the online hosting biz, beautiful segue into what you want to <laughs> share about today, about understanding your purpose. Why did you want to start this off in our series of conversations? Why this, this subject? Because I talk about leadership and people think, oh yeah, leadership, it, it's got to do with um, work or something like that. And, and I really like to say, no, leadership really starts within you, the person. And it really starts off with uh, the first piece, the, uh, the, the foundation of leaders, uh, leadership to me is really where leaders need to be led, okay? And in order to be led, you really need to understand your purpose. And, and I'll digress just a little bit to tell the story of how I discovered my purpose. When I was in Ohio uh, and my wife and I had a great career, we were the typical at the time they were called dinks, double income, no kids. But we were uh, we were succeeding with our careers, doing well with our careers. And we decided, OK, uh, now that we're established in our careers, we're still growing, but we're established. Let's go ahead and have our children and all the good stuff. And so my wife was, uh, we said, okay, no problem. And my wife got pregnant, but unbeknownst to us, it wasn't just, she just didn't have one child. She was pregnant with three. We were expecting triplets. Wow. And so essentially, uh, we ended up changing our, my wife and I were both 
business consultant consultants at the time. We were on the road all the time. So my wife obviously ended up having to come off the road. And I did too. Uh, I, I was able to get a, an assignment there in Cincinnati. And uh, my wife, uh, because of the fact that she was carrying triplets, uh, the doctor ended up taking her off her feet early, the whole nine yards to make sure that she was fine. And she started her, um, uh, her cervix started to open very, very early in the pregnancy. So she was um, uh, put on bed rest, eventually placed in the hospital. Make a long story short, 24 weeks, six days, uh, my wife's placenta ruptured and they had to do a, an emergency C-section. Wow. Now, 24 weeks, six days, a normal gestation period for a pregnancy is 40 weeks. She had it, our, our babies, at 24 weeks, six days. Literally, my, my, all three of my children were born at one pound, six ounces. And after one day, uh, my oldest son uh, passed away. And so we went through the emotions of all of that and then eight days after that, my uh, oldest daughter passed away. So literally oh within two, 10 days, I lost two children. And so not, and then I had a third child who was in the NICU. And remember, she was one pound, six ounces and was only about 11 inches long. Uh, you could really hold her in the palm of, uh, mm. of your hand. And so she was there fighting for her life. And this is, I mean, this was something that we obviously did not expect. And we were really trying to understand why this happened. There was a lot of anger, as you can imagine. Uh, while I had found Christ before then, I, I didn't really get to know him until I went through this very difficult situation. And I had some of my first, what I like to say, real conversations with God, uh, the anger came out, the hurt came out. Why did you do this? All that. And it was during those times. And, and after my daughter started to uh, recover and starting to grow, my daughter was in the NICU, uh, the neonatal uh, intensive care unit. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's basically the ICU for uh, premature babies, little babies. She was in the NICU for three months, and we what we ended up doing was, and during those conversations that I had with God, my purpose was revealed, which was, your purpose isn't just going out and, you know, trying to make money, trying to climb this career ladder. It is, your purpose is here with this little girl, and my purpose is really to prepare my was and was revealed to me. And my purpose was to prepare my child for whatever God had, uh, whatever assignment God had for her. And I knew that uh, because of the fact she was born twenty four weeks six days, she was so small. The odds against her were so great because at that point in nineteen ninety nine, uh, children of that uh, that were born that premature only had between a 13 and 20 percent chance of survival there had to be a reason why she survived and so we really said okay it is our purpose to raise her and to prepare her for whatever god has in store for her and so we uh we totally revamped our careers we instead of being that consultant i found work uh at first on a, uh, a staff position at the same company. And then I ultimately switched to the federal government because I was able to, there were predictable hours, a little bit more stability and all that, but I could be home. I could be a dad. I could be involved to help because um, my daughter, once we, uh, she was released from the NICU after three months. Uh, but actually during the, the, her stay in the NICU, we found out she was, deaf and she had mild, uh, she had cerebral palsy wow. and the uh, uh, all the doctors were saying okay if she's deaf she's never going to be re able to read above a fourth grade level she's never going to be able to walk all these things that they were saying that she was never going to be able to do and uh, I was very polite but in the back of my mind I said okay 
the hell with what you're saying and the hell with you. We're going to make sure that our daughter is able to reach her full potential. So one of the things that when I when I talk about understanding your purpose, not only do you have to recognize your purpose, but you really have to understand that purpose. And by that, I mean, you have to seek wisdom. You have to seek understanding. You have to understand that, okay, if this is your child, this is your purpose, you need to prepare yourself for, for that purpose. And, and you, need to, um, you need to embrace change. Things are going to happen, okay? Um, when I say seeking wisdom, I didn't know anything about cerebral palsy. Nobody in my family was deaf. So, uh, and, and this was something that was totally unexpected. So we literally moved from Cincinnati, Ohio to St. Louis uh, uh, for a school. We were there for about nine months and moved back to D.C. Uh, where she actually attended a school on Gallaudet's campus. And uh, Gallaudet is the school for the deaf in the United States um, or a school that, that, that is, is geared to the deaf. You have people who are hearing that actually attend the school, too. But the primary uh, language is spoken on campus is sign language and things like that. Great university, but it was founded for the deaf. And so, uh, but there they have uh, demonstration elementary and high schools on a campus. So we moved to maximize her chance at life, okay? And one of the things that I really found out about understanding my purpose is I was able to say, okay, um, I need to decrease so that my purpose increases. So what I did was I really discovered the leadership trait of being able to serve something greater than myself. And so that is when you look at this little girl and you say, okay, she needs me. And if it's my purpose to um, ensure that she is prepared for whatever assignment God has for her. I need to get smart. I need to learn about deaf culture. I need to learn about cerebral palsy. I need to learn about um, educating uh, a child with special needs. I needed to know about uh, the uh, IDEA, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, all those types of things. I, I never went to school for uh, medicine but I needed to understand what was going on with her medically in order to make informed decisions so that she would be able to rise and do uh, the things that she is destined to do, okay? So those are the types of things that we really had to learn in order to advocate for her and also lead her to her, uh, to whatever, prepare her for whatever God has for her but really to lead her. And so when I say understanding my purpose, um, it's very humbling to think about, okay, before it's about you, me, 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 but then you find a purpose that's greater than you. So those are the things that I really learned. And that's why I said I wanted to kick off this segment with understanding your purpose, because before you can really lead, you really have to know why you're leading, what you're leading, what you're doing. You, you have to really understand your big why. And, and so that is critical before you really go anywhere else. Well, Jim, that what you just shared, first of all, thank God you're here to share the story. And uh, as, I can, as I can tell you here, Tachi and Tish are just really touched by what you've shared with us and how you've ta taken your test to make it a testimony. And that's exactly what it is. Just an incredible. And I, I knew in previous conversations that we've had offline, I knew that um, your daughter is deaf, but I didn't know the circumstances. And uh, I'm deeply touched. And I know the viewers who are actually watching live or on replay are very touched for, for that sharing. And you mentioned how important it is that when you have a purpose, it's something that's bigger than you. Absolutely. And that is that is really key, because when you have something that's bigger than you, that you're really trying to achieve, when roadblocks are put in your way, you find ways to overcome them. When 
people uh, want to lower your expectations. You say, no, this is what the vision is. This is what we need to do. You keep driving. You, when uh, we have to move all over the country like we've done, uh, like I said, we moved from D.C. to, uh, uh, excuse me, from Cincinnati, Ohio, to St. Louis, Missouri, to Washington, D.C., to Austin, Texas, to make sure that our daughter has the educational capability, uh, the educational opportunity, excuse me, that she needs, and you change your career, and you give up, as anybody who has a, a uh, has has children know, uh, will will test them, uh, will will testify to this. You give up huge financial uh, opportunities for your children if you're going to do all that. I mean, you really have to be living your purpose, and you really have to be um, uh, you really have to be serving something that is greater than yourself. You're no longer just saying about me, 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 but you're looking at something and saying every day you're getting up saying, how can I um, do more? How can I improve this? And and it's not that uh, you are turning your your child into somebody who is, uh, you know, somebody who is a, you know, self-centered or anything like that, but you're trying to give them the opportunities so that they can compete. Um, I We always say that um, we don't necessarily, we always tell Julia, uh, that's my daughter's name, that you have to do your best. I don't care if you get in a class, if you get a C uh, or, or whatever, the, or if you get a B or whatever the, the grade is, as long as you've done your best, then that's fine. And we when we advocate for her, we advocate to make sure that she has the same opportunity to compete as anybody else. You don't give her preference. What you do is you give her the same opportunity. And that's what we, when we advocate, that's what we do. And when we say we're looking to serve something greater for, than ourselves, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Excellent. Just following up here, uh, Tish is saying, uh, Tish Rosales is saying, Lord bless you, Jim. I'm here to the end. She also wanted to know if you had written any books. So I did put in the chat the title of the book that you put out earlier this year so purpose when you deal with clients and you ask them i'm sure you do ask them some sometime during the journey with them what is their purpose do the majority of them know what their purpose is um when we say your purpose they'll they'll basically say something like oh yeah I want to go as far in my career as possible. I want to go and I want to be as successful as possible. And and I say, that's nice. Why? And it's generally like, well, why wouldn't I? I always just want to be successful. And I I always say, if you're on your deathbed and are you going to say, you know, gee, I wish I would have closed one more deal. Gee, I wish I would have closed. Uh, I wish I would have booked this other appointment or whatever. No, you're going to really, you, hopefully, your family is going to be around you or someone who really cares. And, and I really say, okay, so if that is what is matters most to you, then, then why aren't you working toward that right now? Why aren't you um, living that? Why aren't you putting the things in place? to accomplish that right now. And what I, what I mean by that is what is most, you have to remember what is most important. And that's part of understanding your purpose. Remember what is most important. It is not important as important just to go out and, and earn uh, a gazillion dollars. Because at the, at the end of the day, um, if you're living on purpose, Money is not the most important thing. Money, yes, we, we all need money to live, survive, and all that good stuff. But the money is not the object. It is what your, pur- your purpose is, your object. Money it may be a tool to help you get there, but it is not the object of what you are put on this earth for. A, a few things there. And first of all, one of the things I share with people is money funds the mission. It's not the mission. Correct. And so let's take a scenario here, Jim. 
Say I come up to you and say, Jim, I know you're a great guy. You got this, you know this thing, purpose, you got it down pat. I don't know what my purpose is. How can I find my purpose? The one thing that I I I really turn around and tell people is sit down, shut up, and listen. And what I mean by that is when I discovered my purpose, you know, we all if you happen to be a Christian, you know, you, you, you sit down and you pray and uh, you may ask for a whole laundry list of things. God, please me help me with this. God, please help me with that. Fix these kids, you know, whatever it is. But a lot of times you really have to sit down and stop and listen to what God has to tell you, number one. Number two, what you really have to do is you really have to look at your gifts that you were given. I have the gift of writing. I, I also can speak. Uh, but the one thing that I am not gifted at is I can't go out and you got some people that can sell you your own shoes. I, I'm not that person. Uh, I am an encourager, uh, but I'm also not the type of person that is the typical type A personality, which says, I've got to drive, I've got to drive, I've got to drive. <clears throat> and I've got all these bodies, and you know that uh, I've gone through that are on the uh, on the side of the road. You really have to take stock at what the gifts that God has given you, and you really have to sit down and listen. And when you look at your gifts and you look at what you have, what is around you, God always says that I have given you what you needed to succeed. And that's not a biblical verse, but you have what you need to accomplish your purpose. You just have to sit down and listen. And once you do that, you will be able to understand what your purpose is. God doesn't necessarily speak from the voice, uh, from the heavens in some booming voice. There may be other people that tell you, you know, you may want to think about this or inside your, you know, deep down inside, you may recognize, you know, this may be, I shouldn't take this particular job or maybe should not move here or, or what have you. There are clues that you have that you really have to listen to. Nobody can say, here's your purpose for you. That's something you have to discover for yourself. But you really do have to take the time to sit down and listen. Jim is dropping some good knowledge bombs here. He's really rolling on it. So those people who don't have their purpose, you give them sit and listen. Do you also advocate, advocate that if you don't know your purpose, ask people who you trust and asking them, what are, what are the gifts that you see that I have that I may not see? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I'm able to do, uh, I have a person in my own household that is able to keep me grounded. That's my wife. My wife, uh, I've been married for 27 years. My wife knows me in ways that I don't even know myself. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we always talk about a virtuous wife is worth more than gold. And I can attest that that is true. So for me, uh, whenever I am going off course, if you will, my wife will very quickly and directly tell me that. Find that person in your life. Find that person, whether it's your spouse or your, um, you know, a best friend that you've known forever, your parents, that one person that knows you better than you know yourself, where you can have those conversations without fear of retribution or without any sort of fear that your innermost thoughts are going to somehow get out. Have that conversation with that person and, and listen. But the other thing that you also have to do is you have to look at, you really have to think about the situations that you've been in and what you were able to take from them. Everybody has experiences not by happenstance, but there's a reason why you went through a certain experience. There's a reason why I went through um, the difficulty with childbirth that I went through. There's a reason why um, I ended up 
moving all over these uh, all over the United States. There's a reason why I had certain jobs because there are certain jobs um, the doors were closed. But then another window was uh, another job or, uh, you know, there's a reason why people crum come across your path. So you really have to be alert to those things. But yes, also talk to those people who are very close to you. Yeah, that's good. Which involves the foundation of everything for me anyways, is relationships. So that is absolutely. And uh, Tachi and Tish, Tish is saying here, yes, it's not about us, but what we can do for others. That's important. Absolutely. Great. And uh, the, the, the people that are even when you look at those who are extremely successful, um, you, you look at the um, I will say the Warren Buffett's and all, also you look at uh, on the, the John Johnson's. They didn't build massive companies because of the fact that they just wanted money. Money is a byproduct. OK, they built it to serve a purpose to f to serve something to answer or to solve a problem basically and solving problems involve serving and so when you look at your most successful people that's what they really did they cr they solved the problem but they served and it doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily have to go out and create a billion dollar company that's not the the point the point is find what is what it is that you are supposed to do and be the best you that you can be. When and I think one of the keys in regards to purpose is, I think some with some people who have a purpose, they 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 dream big. Yep. Can you share with and, us how you feel that how that comes into the picture about having a purpose and dreaming big? I like to say, don't put God into a box. You may be thinking. Um, I want to provide, let's say, uh, you want to be a humanitarian and want to provide a um, hundred bottles of water to uh, some children in Africa. And God may be thinking, I want you to be able to dig this well so that you can serve hundreds of thousands of people, water in Africa or, or what have you. It, it is don't limit your thinking. Also, don't go down the the path that you want to go down, you have to be open to change. You have to be open to new experiences, new ideas. Change is hard. Nobody likes um, stepping into the unknown. But a lot of times you really have to step into the unknown so that you can see the fullness of what God has for you, the purpose that God has for you. Uh, yes, uh, change is great. Do not limit your thinking. One of the things that um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I said that we, we went through the process with uh, my daughter with our, uh, the, the difficulties of childbirth. And at that point, I was like, OK, I'm done. No problem. And then later on, I had a, an opportunity to adopt two additional children from uh, a Caribbean island. And it, and initially it was like, you know, I, I really don't, I'm not feeling this. I'm not really thinking that uh, this is what I'm supposed to do. So I was sort of resistant to it. And I was also quite honestly looking at, at the amount of money I was getting ready to spend. And the funniest part about the story is my daughter was saying, you know, I, I want to have a brother and sister. And just like a lot of people do, it's like, okay, you know, maybe this is what we're supposed to do. Go ahead and pray about it. And uh, so that's exactly what my daughter did. And so what started happening was God started pushing us in that direction. And I was, we were saying, well, wait a second, this is not what we thought we were going to do. Things just started lining up. And, um, you know, the more Julia prayed, the more things started opening up and the more avenues, uh, the more we received confirmation that that was the direction that we were supposed to go. Uh, another thing that we were talking about, don't limit your thinking. Uh, I told you that my daughter has cerebral palsy. 
she can walk, uh, but her right side is impacted. And she attends school down here at the Texas School for the Deaf. Well, she thought and she believes that uh, we have taught her that if one route is closed, look for another route, find another way. That's our fam family mantra, find another way. And so when she got to high school, she wanted to be a cheerleader. Well, um, at the time, the, the, the coach of the cheerleading squad really didn't give her the time of day, all the good stuff because of her physical challenges. Well, to make a long story short, she kept working at it. She kept working at it. And this past uh, uh, fall, this past spring, she, she tried out again. The coach that originally was there uh, ended up having to take some courses for uh, to retain her teaching certification. She couldn't uh, coach the cheerleading squad. So there was another person that came in that was very open to having Julia on the squad. So not only did she make the squad, and we made the arrangements for accommodations, all that good stuff. Not only did she make the squad, but she also was a varsity cheerleader, which means she cheered all of the home games, uh, all of the, uh, the high school games and all that good stuff. Things just moved out of the way. I was like, okay, we were the ones saying, I don't know if this is going to happen. She did not put any limits on her beliefs. She achieved what, she, what, she, uh, what her dreams were, and that was to become a cheerleader. And in addition to that, all sorts of other opportunities opened up this year. So don't put God into a box. It's a very simple example, but it's one that if you believe it, you can definitely achieve it. Well, I think one of the things I'll add to that is if you want to get out of the box, you got to think out of the box. Absolutely. Definitely. Gotta you got to think. think your way out of it. And that's exactly uh, what the what the uh, uh, that's exactly what the lesson is. First, you got to think it and then you can do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. With the stuff that you're doing now, can you recognize when someone has a purpose without them telling you? Can you just watch a person and you can can you pick up at times that they have a purpose by just watching them? You can, um, because the people that are working within their purpose, nothing stops them. And in other words, um, I have a friend, I was meeting with him uh, a few days ago, and he was at a transition career-wise. Uh, things were going on in his company where um, things were uh, becoming very unstable. And he was working there, not because that was what it, it supported his purpose. He worked there just because he's like, okay, I need money. Uh, I got to feed my family and all that. And he, but everything that he was doing in his life was about something else. And, and so whenever there was an issue on that with that employer, Things he, he kind of let things stand in his way, but when he was doing something out the the other part of his purpose, um, which is you know he's very much into building men up, uh, and so he uh, very very much uh, uh, he's he's is a he is a Christian. He is a uh, very much a positive person. He very much is a uh, I want to help you type of person, but he really has a passion for single men and so uh, helping single men. And so what he everything that he does is around helping people, helping single men so that all the other things in his in his life. And he's got two sons, so he's really doing that at home, too. All the other things in his life, nothing can stop him from accomplishing that purpose. It's just when he does things. Uh, when he goes to his office or his work, he's like, okay, well, I can't do this today. You know, this stand in my way, whatever. And we had the conversation a couple of days ago. I was like, um, you do realize that your purpose, you, you, the work that you're doing is not supporting your purpose. And he said, you know, you're right. And I, you know, I said, he said, but I've got to feed my family. I said, Remember what it says in the Bible. Your gifts will make room for you. You will be able to do 
what it is that God has prepared for you. You just got to sit down and listen. So to answer your question, when you see somebody doing working, it's just like uh, when you see somebody at work, you may see somebody that uh, they are working and uh, the, the job says you're here from eight to five. They run in at 7.59 and they're leaving at five o'clock on a dot, sometimes 4.55. And you realize that what they're doing is not a part of their purpose. And you can see that. But then you see the other people at that same job working not as if they are working for that boss, that supervisor, whatever, but they're really working. I like to say working for God. They are working to improve themselves. To, they're showing their character and they're doing that. They, they're not just doing the basics, but they're going above and beyond as a manager, as a supervisor, as a leader. Those are the people that you want, because not only do you tell them, you don't tell them what to do. You tell them, here's the goal that we have. And you want it, and if they're on board with that goal, you talk with them about how we can achieve that goal, and you give them the tools that they need, and you get out of the way, and you don't have to worry about that being accomplished because they're going to they're going to go through fire for you because they're doing something that is fulfilling their purpose. I have a very interesting question, and you don't you I, I want a yes or no on this. The man that you were talking about, do I know him? Yes. Okay. That I I thought it was. I had a feeling that that was the the person you're talking about. I go, I and when you said two kids, I go, okay, I'm zeroing in now. I'm zeroing in. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to work on that young man. Yeah, I'm not gonna add him on here, but no, but no, yes, no, no, no. I no, no. <laughs> when he I have a thing. He's gonna watch a replay, and he's gonna go. Why did he mention me indirectly? <laughs> and the doctor vibe knows too. So I'm, I'm gonna, right. I'm, so I'm gonna make sure that I'm in good stand because I don't want that man coming up from Texas giving me licks. So <laughs> that's right. Because I know he's a big boy and he's got two wonderful sons too, and I don't I don't need them against me. So that's right. Um, as we're winding down, Jim, uh, it's been a great conversation and so far, and I just I'm looking here. Tish is saying yes, we must listen to what God is trying to show us, telling us. Uh, Tish is also saying when we fine tune our thinking to what God is saying, all kinds of doors will open. And Tachi says, Absolutely. yes, look at God. When, as we wind up here, do you have any final comments in regards to purpose to share with our audience? And also too, before you go, Tish and, Tish and pardon me, Tashi and anyone else who's watching live, if you have any questions, now's the time to put them. The thing that I would say is a lot of people do not pursue their purpose because of fear. They are afraid of what they may find. They're afraid of leading, leaving what is familiar. They are afraid of um, what other people might think. Uh, they are afraid of many different things. I will simply say that God did not give us a spirit of fear. And you always hear whenever an angel showed up in the Bible, when you're reading different stories, the first thing that they always say is be not afraid. And that's the message that I will say to you. Um, the piece that I will say is uh, last year uh, in June, I left my job in uh, Washington, D.C., I was a, uh, uh, I was a, uh, basically a chief of staff for with one of the federal agencies, but I was, we moved here to Texas for my daughter to attend this Texas school for the deaf. And so for four years, I was literally running back and forth on a plane every week. And I was on that plane from, I'd leave early in the morning on Monday and I would come back Thursday night, have to work from home on Friday. I literally would have one day uh, with my children before I had to get ready to get on the plane to go back. And so that, I mean, it took not just my uh, the circumstances, not just God telling me, um, excuse me, you're supposed to be doing something else. Uh, I ended up getting sick and I was home for a couple of weeks and I saw what was happening here in the house and I knew that I was not fulfilling my purpose. So I left. 
I did not have a full-time job to go to. I literally left and said, okay, if this is my purpose, God will make room for what I need to do. And that's exactly what has happened. The thing about it is you do not have to step off of, off of a secure, in a, from a secure, comfortable environment into another secure, comfortable environment. There are times that you're going to get tested. It's okay. The other thing it, that I would say is, and in my particular situation, I ended up going, I like to write, and I ended up starting to write about parenting, leadership, and things like that. And uh, after just working and writing on my own blog, on my own website, uh, uh, a couple of months after that, I got picked up as a contributing writer to the Huffington Post. Um I have written the book, uh, The Discerning God's Purpose. Uh, and as you mentioned at the top of the show, just got picked up as a contributing writer for the Good Men Project. Things are happening and which are great and getting an opportunity to speak, uh, which is great. But it never would have happened if I did not realize I was out of purpose and came back into my purpose. So I will say that if you are struggling with not just understanding your purpose, but going on to live in your purpose, I would say fear not, because if that is God's plan for you, no matter what, God will make a way. God will provide whatever you need to accomplish your purpose that he has ordained. Excellent. Now, I will just add to that, that the pro one of the things I always say is you're your gift or your purpose will take you where your character will fail you. Absolutely. And it's very, very true. And sometimes, as you've seen, Jim is a great testimonial for this. Sometimes you got to jump off a cliff and grow your wings on the way down. Uh, that's, I like to say, you're at, the, you're at the edge of the cliff and you have to take that next step. But there is nothing but air. And you have to take that step. And when you take that step, you'll realize um, God will provide a walkway for you. But you have to take that step. You have to be willing to take that step. I mean, the Bible is full of uh, those types of, of those stories. I mean, you can think about, we all know about Moses and parting the Red Sea. We all know about Joshua. Um, the, the thing that you have to do is you have to take that step. When you take that step and do what you can do, God will do what you cannot do. On those last words, Jim, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your positive, productive schedule, not only from your writing, but more importantly, from your family to share with us this afternoon. And uh, thank you for the, sto the story and the, the journey. I know it's impacted everyone who's watched this live, and I'm sure it's going to be an impact, a positive impact for everyone who watches it on the replay. If people want to get in touch with you, what are the best ways that they can do that? Best way to do it um, is you can email me at jim at jimkennedyleadershipcafe.com. Uh, that's my website. I'm on Twitter at, uh, at JKL Cafe. I'm on Facebook uh, at Jim Kennedy Leadership Cafe. Um, those are the best ways to get a hold of me. And, uh, but before I go any further, I would be remiss by, uh, and, and not saying, telling you, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed this conversation and I've enjoyed getting to know you as well. And I know a lot of the things that you do when I talk about, uh, living a life on purpose, you are a shining example, my friend. So I do appreciate it. Well, I'm humbled by that. I'm not perfect, but I get a little bit better each day. And I just I just do the best I can with what I got because what I got is good enough. So that's the way I roll, my man. It's the way I roll. That's but what yes. we do. But thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who watched us live. I know we had uh, Curtis in here for a bit, ta bit, Tachi and Tish. Thank you. You have been here basically from the beginning of our conversation. Much appreciated, not taken for granted. What anyone who's watching on the replay that's also appreciated. Uh, if you want to touch base with me, three best ways are Twitter at dr v i b e s h o w, website address www.thedrvibeshow.com, and then email address dr period 
V I B E at the D R V I B E S H O W dot com. Uh, you can see a lot of, or hear or listen or see a lot of my conference, uh, com- conversations on different platforms. You can see everything on the website address I just gave. You can get selective com- selective conversations on various platforms such as the Good Men Project, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Tuned In Radio, uh, there may- Google Google Play. Those are some of the platforms. Easiest way, go to the website or just put The Dr. Vibe Show, and that's D-R-V-I-B-E, not the full doctor, uh, show in your in your favorite search engine. As I like to say, I'm very Googleicious these days. <laughs> so that we got off and all done. i like to thank everyone as always. Upcoming scheduled conversations tonight, 9 p.m. at this same place. I'm scheduled to have Tiffany Rochelle. She's going to be having a conversation with me about how some black women are mimicking black gay men. And then tomorrow at uh, 7 p.m. live audio stream, I have an accountant from the Toronto area talking and speaking to African Canadians about the importance of taxes because it is tax season. And then finishing off tomorrow night at 9 p.m., ep- another epic conversation. All of them are, but this one's going to go to another level. We have uh, Zaza Ali, And also Dr. Tommy Curry. And the conversation piece is going to be, are black women leaving black men behind? And that's going to be here on the YouTube live platform. So as always, I'd like to say you're blessed and highly favored, a magnet for miracles and a solution for someone's problem. Remember, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. We will see you soon. And also Jim will be back for more conversations in the near future. So don't worry, you're going to get some more because I know you like them. (laughs) Bye-bye.